The Last Gasp, An Ever After Mystery, written by Shatona Havig, narrated by Krista Del Sorbo. Chapter 6 I saw the shooting, detective, and with what Miss Ashton has shared with me. Excuse me, ma'am, but who are you and why have you barged in? Because, Mrs. Cohen continued without apologizing for her interruption, this man, she pointed at Gary, he may still be in danger. Lucinda heard every word, and each one should have made sense, but really they didn't. At least the steady thrum, thrum of Gary's heart beneath her ear slowly beat away her fear. He'd murmured something, something she'd missed. Then the words reassembled themselves in her mind. It'll be all right, Cinda. Trust me. Trust the Lord, he'd whispered. Detective Lindstrom stood and pointed to the officer who hadn't kept them out of the room. Get back to your post and don't let this happen again. Sorry, sir. The moment the door shut behind him, Mrs. Cohen turned a haughty glare on the detective. You can't blame him. He wouldn't have kept me out without manhandling me, which thankfully he didn't attempt to do. I'd have sued the department and won, and you know it. Who are you? Miriam Cohen, she answered with a huff. And Mrs. Cohen, the man began with ill-disguised exasperation. I'm investigating a murder. Yes, and I'm trying to help you prevent another one. If what I saw is what I think, then the shooter may have been aiming for Mr. Prince after all. She shot a look at Gary. Sunset Studios would love to talk to you about a contract, Mr. Prince. Without missing a beat, she continued, I saw the curtain ripple, and where it was, I think the gun could have been aimed at Mr. Prince, and the girls got in the way. Detective Lindstrom seated himself and looked at the woman. And if you don't mind the impertinence of my asking, what makes you confident in your ability to know the specific trajectory of a bullet based on a curtain ripple? I can't, of course. She jerked an empty chair over and plopped into it, her hands clenched in her lap. But I've been on set enough with these sorts of things. She tossed Gary another smile. I like to understand what my husband's company does. Turning back to the detective, who in Lucinda's estimation, had begun to look amused, she added, Of course, the pistol. I assume it was a pistol? Ma'am. Whatever. Pistol or rifle, the barrel can be pointed in any direction. But since Mr. Garrison was near the victim both times and has had death threats today, one should not risk his life again by making assumptions. No one spoke a word. Lucinda opened her eyes and, Seeing blood on Gary's shirt averted them to nearby shelves. Charleston chews, Wrigley's chewing gums, several kinds of cigarettes, and more candy. Candy. Why did that thought bother her? Cinda. She glanced up and saw concern in Gary's expression. Hmm? What is it? Looking around, she saw everyone staring at them. I... That was the trouble. She didn't know what bothered her, and now with everyone staring, she couldn't remember at all. I don't know. A kerfluffle outside the door prompted a scowl. Detective Lindstrom shot a look at the man behind him and turned back to Mrs. Cohen. I... The door burst open and the officer said, Sir, the folks out in the theater are getting awfully restless. This one just came in to say they're all leaving. Not him, of course, or he wouldn't have come in, but... They're not going anywhere. Lindstrom rose and shot a weary look at Lucinda, Gary, and Mrs. Cohen. You three, go back to the theater and keep quiet about your theories. I'll call you back as soon as I can. If it weren't for all these interruptions, I might be through with this part of the investigation. He spoke as if shouting, but the man's volume never raised above conversational levels. With Gary's arm around her shoulder and Mrs. Cohen right beside her, they made their way back into the theater. Only a third of the people were left. The balcony area had been emptied and was now dark. The orchestra pit had been emptied and all instruments put away. A glance at the organ showed the organist gone. 
He'd been playing, so it couldn't be him. She mused aloud. What was that? Lucinda pointed at the enormous Wurlitzer organ, but the words didn't come. Gary steered her that way, and Mrs. Cohen followed. I think shock is settling in. After all, she was reasonably close to two gunshots today. Her mind insisted that she knew what those words meant, but even as she walked across the richly patterned carpet, Lucinda tried to follow them. A cigarette butt, still smoldering, lay on the carpet. She broke away from Gary and snatched it up. After licking her fingers, she squeezed it a few quick times before it finally went out. Smokers are so inconsiderate, she snapped. Tears flowed then. Gary pulled her close once more and led her to the organ. He seated her and offered to find a glass of water. Perhaps some coffee. They won't allow that, Mrs. Cohen snapped. But you stay with her. I'll see what I can do. Alone with Gary, Lucinda grew nervous and turned to face the organ. One hand resting on the bench, the other on the keys, she tried to imagine what it might be like to know which ones to press to make the sounds needed for the perfect melody. Music sat resting on the rack, the black notes marching up and down the lines like ants working their way through a picnic. I wish I could play. We'll get you lessons, Gary assured her. When we're married... Will that ever happen? When Lucinda didn't respond, he lowered himself to the bench beside her and murmured, Please don't be angry with me, Cinda. You didn't tell me who you were. Why? I. She interrupted him as what Miss Cohen had finally said reached the proper connections in her brain. Gary! He stiffened and made a move to push her down, but she wrenched free from his grasp. Staring at him, she gasped. Mrs. Cohen! She couldn't have done it, Cinda. I... No! Startled by her own vehemence, Lucinda lowered her voice and leaned closer to him. What she said, it's true. The first time, I was close enough that, depending on where the shooter was, the shot could have been meant for me. And the second time, I was right there, not even inches away. Eyes closed, doing everything she could to steady nerves that wanted to send her into hysterics, she said. What if the bullets were meant for me? The opulence of the Taj Mahal Theater intruded on their quiet corner even before Mrs. Cohen returned with a glass of water and a candy bar. She listened to Lucinda's concerns with the eyes of one who saw more than was spoken. I'll return after I speak with Mr. Cohen, Perhaps he'll be able to make that detective listen. She eyed Garrison with a hard look. You'll protect her? I will. Though he didn't speak it, his heart insisted, With my life. The woman's smile told him that, again, she heard what he didn't say. As she strode away with a tread that looked more suited to sturdy boots than evening shoes, Lucinda leaned against his arm, froze, and relaxed her head resting on his shoulder. Gary? Yes? I know that you wanted to wait until Sunday to talk about this, but I don't know if I'll be there Sunday if I don't know the answer to one question. His heart clenched. Cinda, I did try to tell you, not in our times at the park, but on nights when you sold me cigarettes and candy. He gazed out over the theater, his eyes taking in the repetitious patterns, the gilt edges, the marble statues of Indian gods and goddesses, the gold velvet seats, the arches. If you'd said my name... Again, he hesitated before saying, I did tonight when I tipped you. You never looked at me. Not once. It's recommended that we don't. If we fawn over the actors and actresses, we could lose our jobs. She met his gaze and held it. But all the times we walked through the park the times we ate at the lunch counter after church, or the times we went to the pictures at Tally's. Why not tell me then? Prayer was his only hope. Well, the one who answers prayer is. How can I explain without casting doubt on her character? Gary? Can you imagine for just a moment that all you do is serve people candy and cigarettes? You go home, 
walk into Mrs. Smith's parlor and she says, I'd like some Chesterfields, please. He smiled at her wrinkled nose but continued, And when you went into the drugstore to have a malted, how would you feel if someone stopped you on the way and asked you for a package of chewing gum? You enter church and the minister requests you see what everyone would like before he begins his sermon. He covered their hands with his other now and said, How would you like your whole life to be nothing but what you saw as a means to support yourself? She watched him, her eyes searching for something he hoped she found, or didn't. Which was it? I don't like the sound of it, she said after a long pause. But can you see why I don't know who you are? Are you Garrison Prince, the Hollywood star? Or are you Gary Prince, my Gary, who likes my new green dress, all covered in dust and cobwebs now, better than my pink one? Which one did I choose today when I refused to sign a contract? He countered. Cinda, I told Mr. Walker that I wouldn't sign six months ago. I decided even before that, before I met you. But once I did meet you, I knew I wouldn't be tempted to change my mind no matter what he offered. Is he really so very angry? Furious. He threatened me, but I thought it was embarrassment talking. He'd called in the press for the contract signing. I think he assumed I wouldn't make a scene and he'd have me for another six years. She took her hand from his, smoothed her skirt, laced her fingers together, and rested them on her lap. But she didn't move from his side. I think I understand, somewhat. You didn't know if I'd be like the Smith girls. Only when he saw himself staring down at her did Garrison realize he had stood, probably paced a bit too. You don't understand. I didn't think about what you'd do, not after the first couple of days anyway. I just enjoyed being Gary again. He forced himself to sit down again as he said, I just enjoyed being me with you. His hopes plummeted as she shook her head. I don't understand. Cinda gave him a weak smile. But I have a couple of days to work on it, don't I? You're still coming on Sunday? A bang! rang out from backstage. Gary dove for her, pinning her down. Screams rippled through the theater again. He heard footsteps pounding up the stairs, and an officer pushed open the curtain. Sorry, folks, he shouted to the room. Someone knocked over a flat board. No one's hurt. Standing, he offered his hand and helped Cinda to her feet. She gave him a wobbly smile and said, I'm coming, unless we die here first as if speaking the words drove home all that had happened, Lucinda Ashton burst into tears. For one melodramatic moment, Lucinda allowed herself to think, If I can't trust Gary, I hope we do die here. Then she rose, brushed off her skirt and smoothed her hair, scolding herself all the while. I do not wish to die rather than lose Gary, but if I had any lingering doubts about my affection for him... Lucinda paused her thoughts and listened to her heart before continuing. I think they're gone. Now I have to decide if his duality equals inexcusable duplicity, but after I sleep. Cinda, are you all right? You look... dazed. Gary's words wrapped her in concern and held her close, even as he made a visible effort to hold himself back. Just... she closed her eyes steadied herself and tried again. So much to take in. Gary tried to urge her to sit again. It's hard to imagine that someone in this room is a murderer. The moment the words left his lips, he apologized. I don't know what I was thinking bringing that up. You've been through enough without... Mrs. Cohen appeared and began scolding both of them. Gary for not insisting she drink the water and eat the candy bar... Lucinda for not doing it in the first place. Now, I want a good long drink out of you before another word. No. Lucinda ignored her for a moment and turned back to Gary. You're wrong. The shooter may not be in this room. After all, he wasn't in here when he fired the gun. He could have left by the back door, hidden somewhere, and come in and mingled, 
or a host of other ideas. But there's no guarantee he's out here, considering both shots appear to have come from back there. With the glass now thrust into her hand, Lucinda drank as Mrs. Cohen relayed what her husband had learned. They're letting almost everyone go, she said. Everyone who has someone who can verify his or her presence during both shots. After a pointed look that promised Lucinda to take another sip of water, she added, I believe both of you will be allowed to leave since you couldn't have been the shooter. They'll speak with you tomorrow. I can't. Lucinda stopped mid-thought. I, that is... More nonsensical words babbled as she watched a girl chatting with Mr. Walker. Flirting, it seemed. What is she? Another girl slipped around the orchestra pit and through the left side door. Was that? No. Lucinda? Excuse me a moment. Lucinda thrust the water back into Miss Cohen's hands and dashed to follow. Gary would have come too, but she firmly pushed the door closed in his face, saying, Stay out there. Someone back here could be out to harm you. But the door had a lock, and Lucinda utilized it. A single pound and a, Cinda, no, followed. But she ignored it and went to see what Opal thought she was doing behind stage with a murderer on the loose. Foolish girl. The fact that she'd gone into the fray as well did not speak much for her own intelligence, but Lucinda chose to ignore that bit of information. Officers swarmed the area, but Lucinda managed to dodge most of them. Oddly enough, Opal appeared to have done so as well. She couldn't find the girl anywhere, and not one officer led anyone out to the front of the house. The third time she barely managed to dodge an oncoming policeman, Lucinda decided it wasn't worth getting into trouble to save Opal from self-inflicted foolishness. She should have looked to the consequences, as should I. A hand grabbed her arm just as Lucinda slipped back through the door and into the theater. A man's hand. She jumped, wrenching her arm from the grasp and ready to run. Cinda, you startled me. Mrs. Cohen appeared at her other elbow. Whatever made you go back there? I thought I saw... The lights flickered. All eyes rose to the great chandeliers overhead, to the lights in the sconces along the walls, and to the stage area. A bang rang out through the back of the theater. A few bulbs popped. The entire room plunged into darkness. She felt Gary move closer, put his arm around her shoulder. He asked if she was all right before asking Mrs. Cohen the same. Was it another shot? More likely the fuse box, Mrs. Cohen said. It's not uncommon for them to have an explosion of sorts, and it didn't sound the same as those shots to me. The woman's voice was nearer, as if she'd turned to Lucinda. What do you think, Miss Ashton? I agree. It sounded much less sharp, less of a crack, and more of a bang. Tears threatened, but Lucinda did everything she could to hide them. As Gary's arm tightened around her, she realized she hadn't succeeded. One tear rolled down her cheek, followed by another, and then more than she could count. Grateful for the cover of darkness, she waited for the ushers to appear. The doors swung open, beams of light entered, Gary turned toward her then. Let's go up top and see if they'll let us go. I'll take you back to Mrs. Smith's. I can't go back there tonight. Just as they reached the aisle, the side door opened, and two officers emerged, supporting someone in the middle. As an usher neared, they saw him, Detective Lindstrom. Hunched over, the man gripped his side and allowed himself to be half pushed, half carried along. Gary spoke the words first. I suppose it was a gunshot, just fired from a different place. Mrs. Cohen moved closer to Lucinda and murmured, Stay close together, and I'm coming up the rear. If either of you are targets, we're all sitting ducks. At the back doors, the officers wouldn't let anyone leave. Someone shot Detective Lindstrom and we're... A few reckless expletives flew from the man's mouth. As annoyed as she might usually have been... Lucinda ignored the words. We couldn't have shot him if we were up here, Mrs. Cohen argued. Until the detective's safe and we have searched for the gunman, no one leaves, the man argued. Just take your seats and we'll be with you as soon as we can. 
a room full of silhouettes stood about, talking, complaining, crying. A tall, thin man moved to where Gary, Lucinda, and Mrs. Cohen stood and said, I'm trying, Miriam, but you see how they are. If either of these people die because the police can't do their jobs. What else the couple said, Lucinda didn't hear. Something was wrong, terribly wrong, but her mind refused to cooperate and reason out a solution. Her nose, however, did. Do I smell smoke? Tune in tomorrow for the next chapter. Thanks for listening.